So Seamus, as you guessed, our first topic is two-factor authentication. Have you had a requirement foisted upon you recently? Yes, I did. For me, it was YouTube. They threatened to lock me out of my account if I didn't give them my phone number. Really? Right. They offer all these... There will be multiple ways that you can, you know, secure your account. And then you can look... And then you look at the option and it's text message or direct message or something like that. You know, SMS or text or whatever. But they both, you know, are your phone number. And yeah. They're like, G give us, give us your phone number, and and now, <laughs> hey, and baby. now, it, right? I'm just, I'm gonna try that at the bar. I'll be like, hey, baby, um, I require you to give me your phone number right now, or I will lock you out of your Google account. <laughs> for me, it was also Google, but I don't know why they didn't say it for YouTube. But they're like, oh. Because you have a Google Ads account, you need to enable two-factor authentication. You could do the MMO thing where you say, Hi, I'm from support. Please tell me your login and password so I can fix a problem with your account. Yeah, you, I'm sure you've got a problem with your account. So uh, give me your phone number, baby. <laughs> right. Just give me your phone number and your home address. And I will solve this problem that you have that you didn't know about. Of not having me in your life. <laughs> so, yeah. And it's just annoying. And I hate, like, a year ago, my phone never got any spam calls. Or it would be, like, once a month. It would only be completely blind random callers. So it's, like, once, once a month, maybe twice a month, I'd get a robocall. Not a big deal. And then... You know, about six months ago, it kicked up to, like, once a week, and then a couple months later, it was, you know, a few times a week, and now it's every day I get a spam call. We've been trying to reach you about your home. I hate the ones that, like, begin with an obvious lie. The, the ones we've... We reached out to you before concerning the warranty on your car. That one. We're from your... They try to make it sound like we already have some sort of relationship uh -huh. i mean that's just strong bad level of like prank call hi this is dr <laughs> professional and i'm calling about your test results that you have when you got a test and it's like oh well it sounds legit so and the point i, <laughs> I was have making, a car as it turns out <laughs> the point i was making is that i blame systems like this you know everybody requires your phone number for two-factor authentication and you give it to them and then they fucking sell it and you don't even know who did it like if it's an email you can give like i can do um seamus dot you know google at seamusyoung.com or whatever and then give them that and they'll all go to the same email ad address but they'll be i'll know who took i'll know who sold my phone who sold my email, but you can't do that with a phone number. You could probably like set up a whole bunch of free VoIP accounts. Yeah, but still they get you either way. You either waste the time hanging up on robocallers or you waste the time managing a, a an array of VoIP accounts. Either way. Yeah, I just hang up on all calls that aren't from someone already in my address book. Right. Oh, but them it, spam. Right, I can't do that, but this is another reason I I can't do that because uh, all my medical problems. I have doctors constantly calling me with results with, hey, we need you to come in and get a new test. So, like, you know, a few months ago, mm -hmm. I got a call from a number I'd never heard of before. And it was my nephrologist saying, uh, your potassium is super high and it's going to kill you. Um, so, uh, <laughs> no. I'm sending you some powder right now, or no, when you swing by my office, get this powder, put it in a drink and drink it, and it'll suck all the potassium out of your system. And then, uh, and then, uh, stop eating potassium. So if I hung up on that, that might, might have gone poorly for me. Yeah. Well, I, I usually wait to see if they leave a message and then if they leave a message, That's it's like, true. okay, well now I know who you are. 
And if the message is six seconds, exactly six seconds of silence, then it was a robot. Oh, the, the uh, people that try to reach you about your car insurance always just start talking when it picks up. So then it's like in the middle of their automated message when it begins recording. So like they haven't even solved the problem of leaving you spam voicemail. Uh-huh. Detecting whether or not it's the Google's automated assistant talking to them. Right. So tell me, I, I derailed you. Tell me your um, two-factor authentication story. Oh, so Google's like, uh, you really need to turn on. In fact, we're going to turn it on for you. We're going to turn it on automatically. You don't have to make any decisions. It's, it's ready for you. It's already prepared. We're going to make this sound good. You just need to enable it. No, they're like, look, we're going to turn this on, okay? You don't have an option. We're going to enable it for you on November 9th. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and they're like, but you could turn it on early. Here are all the benefits of turning it on early. <laughs> and I was like, all right, fine. If you're going to make me do this, um, fine. So I went in and I was like, okay, enable two-factor authentication. What are my options? And they're like, well, you could do it with your phone. We could text you or we could give you a call or you could write down a one-time pad of all these random numbers and then use those random numbers to log in. And I appreciate the option. Like, That's okay. Cool. I wish they'd given me that. Yeah, it's weird that it's like, it's Google doing this, right? Like YouTube is Google, but they're requiring it about the same time and they're going about it in different ways. So, so I was like, fine. Fine, Google. You already, I've got Google Voice. You already know my phone number. Like, this isn't giving you any information that you don't have. So, uh, so I was like, fine, I guess. Text me your login thing. And it does the, you know, waiting for a second. And then it's like, oh, we can't do that right now. You'll have to try again later. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> suckers. <laughs> so, Hopefully that's the last we hear of two-factor authentication from Google. I'm sure it's not, but if if they just keep having errors, then it's like, well, it's not my fault, Google. You want to turn it on? You figure it out. I don't know why they didn't give me the option to use email. That's what I want to use. Like, we have password recovery emails. That's We've had that since the 90s. Well, why, why yeah, is that not I, good Yeah, I think enough? the idea is that if if you're some sort of rube, so I, oh, oh, okay. So <laughs> the story's not over yet, Seamus. So I, I was like, all right, fine. I'll, I'll try to do this. It failed. I'm like, okay, great. I'm off the hook. Um, but then just for fun, I was like, okay, well, so I'm going to go in and delete my YouTube, Google, whatever it is, Google ads or whatever. I'm going to like deactivate my Google ads account. And maybe that will not make them require me to turn it on in the future or demonstrate that they can't turn it on in the future or whatever. So, right. so I was like, okay, I'm going to deactivate that. I pushed the button and, you know, did the thing. And then I was like, you know what? They should know that their two-factor authentication thing is harassing people because at this point is harassment. It's not like, oh, you know, here's this thing you have to engage with. It's like, hey, we've got this broken system. It doesn't work. We're going to force you to, like, fiddle with it. And I was like, okay, all right, fine. I'm going to report it. So I go, I hit the little button at the top of Gmail, right? I've got the email open. I hit the button saying report problem and I'm like, include screenshot. And then, and it spins and spins and spins for what? And then the button just unchecks itself. <laughs> it can't figure out how to take a screenshot in Facebook or in, not Facebook and Google in their own web browser, right? I'm not using a Safari or something. I'm using Chrome. I've got the latest version of Chrome. They can't figure out how to take a screenshot of their own email. Like this is Gmail in Chrome, an email from Google. It's not like this is some sort of weird attack. Like this is this is all their stuff and it's all broken. So in the report, I'm like, look, you guys made me turn this on. I couldn't turn it on because your system's broken. I couldn't even report it properly because the other system that you use for reporting stuff is broken. And on top of all that, I don't really need this. This is for people who have the same password for every account and you don't want to use yep. the email as a, as a backup because if they use the same password for every account, then their email is going to be compromised. But I use different passwords for every account. And you know what, Google, 
You can tell because you have my password saved. <laughs> So, oh. so I was like, look, you know, this whole thing is nonsense. And obviously no one, no human being is going to read the email report that I sent in. It's going to be parsed out and, and uh, amortized and they're going to put it in their system and it's going to get filtered through a bunch of stuff and they're going to get a slightly lower rating on whatever keywords show up in there. Right. But there'll be some, it at some like point somebody will see a, yeah, somebody will see a spreadsheet with those keywords and the bar will be, you know, one thousandth of a pixel higher because you filed that report. Right, right, exactly. But I feel like I won. This entire process feels very much like Microsoft. And it used to be like 10 years ago, Google knew what they were doing. Their stuff worked. Chrome was magical. It was like downloading and installing IE was this like download it and save it and I, I forget like unzip it or something you <laughs> just like this five-step process and chrome you just click a button in in the browser and it would just like launch chrome and now it's installed and everything was so graceful and slick and awesome and now all of their their stuff is this horribly interconnected mass of broken half abandoned systems and it's a nightmare yeah yeah it's real sad i i really wish that they had not canceled all the neat tools that they used to have and instead of just like let us use them that would have been great yeah i have the same problem with two-factor authentication and yeah i i would rather use email and i have the same problem is that it it just creates all this additional hassle for me um, that isn't necessary because I use different passwords for every single account. It sucks. Yeah. So I was, I was going to, um, going to apply to jobs. I've been applying to jobs and stuff, uh, still looking for work. And one of the jobs that came up was this engineering role at Meta, which is Facebook's new thing, I guess. So I saw that I saw the, I saw somebody commenting on brand washing with Meta, but I don't know what it is. I know it's linked to Facebook, but I don't know what it is or what they're doing with it or what their intent is or anything. So I am completely in the dark as to what Meta is. Meta is just Facebook. It's, it's exactly the same. You go to the Meta like job board and it's facebookemployment.com or whatever. Huh. So, um, so this is a company that's like their only thing is like internet account stuff. Like that's all they do all day long. It's just like you have an account, you log in, it knows all the stuff and it shows you what you want. Yep. So I try to apply for this job and it's like, oh, oh do you no. have an account with, with Facebook jobs? And I'm like, mm, no, I've got a normal Facebook account. And I'm like, no, 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 that's something completely different. You have to create a Facebook to... jobs account. Okay, Facebook. That's ridiculous. Fine. So I'm like, all right, well, this is a good opportunity for me to like, you know, use a different email. I'll use my work email instead of my personal email. Uh, so I, you know, I cre create the thing and upload my resume. And then I'm like, okay, well, can I go back and apply to that job? And it's like, here are some suggestions for jobs that you'd like to apply to based on your profile. I'm like, oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so I'm trying to like, pilots. <laughs> well, I mean, they're all like, yeah. So there's this very specific job that's like, you know, has to do with air conditioning and mechanical engineering. Cause I'm not a software guy. I mean, I can do software. I can program a bit, but I'm not like a Facebook tier. Well, maybe I am because so I, I'm like, all right, I finally go back to LinkedIn, click on the job. It takes me the, the, Facebook site and in the top right corner, there's a login thing. And so I was like, okay, well, login. Uh, yes, I already have an account. And so then it's like, okay, well, type in your login stuff. And so I type in my login stuff and sends me an email and I get an email and you know, okay, I'm logged in, but now I'm back at the page where it doesn't know what job I'm trying to apply to. So I go back to the page that's got the job thing. And every time I go to the page that's got the job, I'm not logged in there. And every time I click login, 
it just takes me completely away from that job that I wanted to apply to. So it's obvious what the, they need to hire you for is to fix the fucking login. <laughs> right. Like, and it's, it's not like I'm using an incognito window or something. Like, I'm doing this in the clear, you know, in my normal Chrome window. And just, like, it doesn't, it doesn't know how to connect those two. So I finally, like, figure out some way around to, like, go to the main page and, like, search through jobs and find the job. Um... And, you know, and get it working. But it's just, it's so incredible to me that this is all, this is all they do. This is everything about them is this thing. And they can't get it right. Like, I don't understand how this is possible. How is it possible that this company has gotten so big and powerful when they can't do the one thing that they need to do? Like, there's just one thing. It's, that's all you do all the time, Facebook. I'm sorry, Meta, whatever. What are your pronouns, Meta? <laughs> <laughs> so somebody gave a talk a few years ago. I think it might have been John Blow. Where, oh, yeah. The, the collapse of talking, civilization. It might have been that. Talking about how many coders are working at, like, Twitter or Facebook. And it's like, we, we have this product. And we've got, like, five coders. And then they have an IPO. And then the number of coders ramps up from like five or six people to a hundred and then to 500. But like, what do these people do all day? Uh -huh. They're like for us in the public, there's nothing visible. The product doesn't improve. And it's basically just companies where, you know, individual managers are just trying to grow their individual little fiefdoms by getting more people on in their tribe yeah it's bonkers it gets worse right like it's the too many cooks in the kitchen problem this is an old problem right right too many cooks in the kitchen but now it's like too many teams of cook too many teams of reality <laughs> show uh cooking stars all trying to do their reality restaurant revamp show in the same kitchen <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Microsoft has been deep, neck deep in this problem for years now. Like decades. Like, I think for them, it went back to the 90s. And for Google, I think it's happened over the last 10 years. But I think what's interesting is you, if you remember, like back in the aughts when Google was young and sexy, they used to, like, do those puzzle billboards where it was, like, you'd have to have a genius-level IQ to even realize what the puzzle is. And if you could solve it, then it would tell you, you know, where to mail your resume because they only wanted to hire super, super geniuses. Yeah. And, and obviously, one, that doesn't filter out, you know, assholes, problem people, jerks, lazy people. Yeah. Have you heard of the evil super genius, Google? Right. <laughs> right. All you want, that, that's all you care about is smart. You, there's th nothing else. No honesty, you know. Reliability. Stick-to-itiveness. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, hard work, dependability. Yeah, not, none of that. You just want the smartest possible people. But then on top of that, you put these super smart people under the leadership of backstabbing, backbiting, self-aggrandizing, dipshit managers that just want to grow their power by building little kingdoms. And, and can get away with it because if they don't make a good product, it doesn't actually matter because they're this huge, huge corporation and it's not going to take the whole thing down. Yet. Right. Nobody even knows where all the money's going. So now you have this giant, bloated, confused organism that doesn't even know what it's, what it, it doesn't even know its purpose for existing anymore. It just, it just has this urge and it just decides to email everybody it's ever met and tell them to I, to activate two factor authentication. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm getting a drunk call from Google. Yeah, they heard about how, you know, people stereotypically, you know, complain about governments getting large and bloated and they're like, hey, 
Companies can do that too. <laughs> Hold my beer. Hold my beer. <laughs> we could be just as large and dysfunctional and... Oh, you're mad at the Pentagon for wasting money on $500 toilet seats? Well, just where do you see the stuff we mess... we waste money on? Oh, man. We, yeah. We'll, we'll waste... Five million dollars on people that don't do anything. I mean, a toilet seat at least gets sat on, but like we're gonna employ people that do nothing but generate problems. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you think you can mess things up? You only run a country. We run the world, <laughs> right? <laughs> we're gonna hire some very smart people and have them make some very bad decisions, <laughs> and you will <laughs> never figure your way out of it. Oh boy. Well, this has all gotten much too real. Is there is there any video games you played this week? Um, I played a little bit of I played some um Hitman 2. I, I actually started watching um I, I needed to sort of clear my head from all the stuff I've been playing. I needed to take a break from New World and that. And I was like I, I just randomly stumbled across um a YouTuber called Big Mooney, and uh, he just plays Hitman wrong. That's the entire point of his videos, is like, try to kill everybody. And it is just a disaster of <laughs> just an epic disaster. Because the game is not designed to be Doom, right? Yeah, yeah. This is, and so if you really want shit to get weird, you behave in this outrageous way because then you'll see like the ai really struggle to make sense of the world right you you're pushing the systems to their absolute limit and it's just chaos um and i was like wow that looks like fun so i fired up hitman and i played a couple levels wrong and what one thing i discovered quickly is that um he makes it look easy but it's really friggin hard um it's real easy to die it is just, he makes it look easy. He'll run into a room and like get in a fight with seven people and live through it. And I like pick one person off and instantly get swarmed from all sides and drop dead. And I'm like, don't even know what I could have done to not die in that situation. But um, <laughs> it's really, really fun. It is the most fun you can have while losing. It's just, you know just a comedy of errors where you're trying to quick drop this weapon before somebody sees you carrying this illegal thing, but it's the same button that has you pick up a random object and, and you're like, oh wait, no, I don't want that. And you try to put it down, but you panic and you click the left mouse button and you hurl the object at somebody and it strikes them in the face and knocks them out. And now you've got a body in the middle of the floor and a, made a bunch of noise. And you realize, oh, and you're still pain. holding this flagrantly dangerous weapon in your right. other hand. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You still got the illegal weapon on your back or whatever, and you're trying to pull it out. And then somebody <laughs> comes in and starts shooting at you, and you're trying to figure out what to do. And I'm like, I'll hit him with this grenade and donk. Oh, that was a coconut. I just had coconuts in my pockets that I picked up at random. So, yeah. That's Hitman 2. That's what I did this week. It was delicious fun. Um, what did you do? Well, I've been doing a lot of 3D model commissions, but in my spare time, I have finally gotten around to playing the Satisfactory Update 5. And it released uh, a week ago, I think. Did they finally fix the bug where you could sometimes get conveyor belts working? <laughs> and they altered that, yes. Uh, so one of the really cool things about Update 5 is that they have uh, loosened the restrictions on collisions. So you can now, they've got something called soft clearance where um, anything that's not another production building can just like clip inside of anything else and it'll turn yellow oh. when you're building it, but it'll let you do it. Oh, so you don't, so you can run conveyor belts through that giant empty space above the machines that it thinks yes. is a solid mass. Yes, exactly. Can, you can put conveyors there. You can put, uh, you know, concrete, whatever the foundations there. You can run railways through it, whatever you want. Oh, Just as long as it's not nice. like a production building. 
Yeah, it's it's really nice. sweet. I so that's great. It, a lot of this stuff like that is like real quality of like kind of things. Um, oh, there's you should train collisions, that. which is kind of like <laughs> the opposite of quality of life. Uh, I don't know if you have a big <laughs> rail network set up. I've never had more than one train. Oh, really? Right. Oh, that's fascinating. Well, I, well, no, I'd finally like, I'd finally get the train built, and I'd be like, I'm just so done. I just, I just spent years building track across the wilderness to get the oil to my, because I always want to build in the, the green area with lots of flat space. But, oh yeah, the grasslands. Yeah, the grasslands, but that, that's like two and a half kilometers to get oil. Two and a half kilometers yeah. of building track. It's halfway between two oil spots. Right, and it is just, I mean, it just, that's like an entire day of playing the game to get that working. It's so that, you know, the train isn't going, clipping through stuff and doesn't look terrible and it isn't a magical floating thing and everything looks like it's supported because I, I like doing that. And by the time it's all over, I'm just like, I, I don't want to build another train ever again. Oh, then you're going to love zooping. Oh, nailed it. So there's this new feature where you can, instead of laying down one foundation at a time, you can lay down one and then just like drag it in a whole line up to 10 at once, horizontally or vertically. And you can snap them to the bottom of railways. So you can like build a railway, you know, it's like all hanging out over space. And then oh, you just like click on the yeah. railway, drag it down to the ground. You've got a pillar. It's so great. Oh my goodness. That's magnificent. I need it. Oh my goodness. The hours I spent getting that to work because when you're up in, you need to be up in the air to get the pile started. But then mm -hmm. after a while, you're no longer at the right angle and you need to be below it. So now you need to climb down from wherever you are. And and you don't have jetpacks yet. Because you've nope, got to finish the need fucking fuel. railway. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, oh, it was just a torture. The entire system was just pure torture of like, oh, I really needed this six hours ago. And it just... Oh, I'm still yeah. angry. I, I don't know how that whole progression works. I have not started over in uh, my, my current game has, uh, it was the one that I did for update three. I think I started for update three and it's got like 300 hours on it or whatever. So I just keep, you know, right. re redoing stuff and not starting over. So I don't know if they fixed the progression or not. Um, but there are a lot of really handy tools now for placing things quickly and, and getting things lined up making roads is much easier now you can zooping works horizontal but it also works on slopes and at an angle so you can just like whoop make a big old ramp all at once very nice. handy yeah yeah uh so mass construction of it works for foundations and walls and um most of the non-cosmetic stuff you know railings and things or the non uh construction what else they've got a bunch of cosmetic changes uh you can put down big um uh, on the concrete foundations, you can put down uh, stencils like paint or whatever. So you can paint like, you know, caution tape or walkways or like big arrows or numbers or whatever. They've got doors that work uh, both for vehicles and for for pedestrians. Um, cool. They updated the map and some of my factories buried, but it works still. So I guess I didn't need to get to that part of the factory. <laughs> Whoops. But... I know you and all our listeners are most interested in whether or not they have fixed the control inversion applying to vehicles. Oh, yes. That's, I, I, I knew I this whole time, th this whole time I've been like, what's the one other thing that really, really pissed me off and I couldn't remember? That's exactly it. <laughs> Is that fixed? I, I remember that you wanted to know and so I tested it out and no, it's not fixed. <sighs> How is that possible? How can you possibly not fix that? I guess no one uses the feature, Seamus. Um, the stuff I've read, like, says that, like, 5 to 10% of people invert. So, statistically, thousands of people, I think thousands of people just are used to the fact that when you get into the car, everything's backwards and annoying, gives you a headache. 
You, you just don't move the camera when you get into the car. Just don't. Move that's the that's basically what I try and do. But then you know you go, you crest a hill and you start heading down, but the camera's pointing the wrong way and you can't see where yeah, you're going. Yeah, it doesn't actually follow the elevation of the vehicle, just the lateral, the lateral right. uh, roll or whatever, the twist, the yaw. Right. So you have to continually correct the camera up and down. In the you have direction. to correct it, but you know they won't bother to correct it. Well, that is like unforgivable. Ugh. That is just disgusting and sickens me. Ugh. Now I'm mad again. <laughs> oh, good. We're we're in perfect form for some mailbags. All right. I'll read this first one because it's short. Dear Diecast, if you had to choose one, would you rather have a PC with A, a great CPU but terrible GPU, or B, a terrible CPU but great GPU? Vale Tim. Paul, what's your thoughts? I pick A, hands down. Same. Like, what are you going to do with the GPU if your CPU sucks? Play a game at high settings with terrible frame rate? Like, what? <laughs> The, there's, input lag. there's right tons of input lag i i just can't imagine a really great gpu being useful without a cpu to back it up but if you've got a great cpu there's all kinds of cool stuff you could do um you can play all kinds of like old games and even some recent ish <laughs> games like you know 2010, 2012, 2013. There's some stuff. Yeah, back you can then. also, like, you know, do rendering and stuff. Right. Oh, yeah. Blender. Blender. Don't try and use Blender with a terrible CPU and a great GPU. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it helps to have a GPU, but uh, yeah, yeah the does. CPU is the core. It's, well, it's like the, it's like the manager thing, right? Like the CPU is kind of managing the whole computer and the GPU is this specialist, like, sub thing. It's, I mean, like, the, the system with a terrible CPU and a great GPU is basically like the Google management system. <laughs> right. Although, I, I honestly, when I use, um, is it Cycles? What's the good look? What's the, the renderer you're supposed to use that looks sexy and not the Yeah, the terrible Cycles one? is the photo, it's the, um, the ray tracer, yeah. Is Cycles? I don't notice much when, you know, it's got the little experimental drop down where you can say to use the CPU or GPU. I don't mm. think it gets that much smoother when you switch to GPU. Maybe a little bit, but in a complicated scene, it's, you know, not that big a deal. GPU yeah, you, rendering. It, there are, when you really get into like optimizing for performance and rendering, there are things you can do. And the kinds of things you do depend on whether you're optimizing for CPU or GPU. So it it does, yeah. It, in general, uh, GPU does better when you have a simple scene with lots and lots of samples, and CPU does better with a complex scene. Um, but you know, the sample count needs to stay kind of low for it to be performant. Okay, so the difference would be more noticeable if I knew what I was doing. Okay, well that that makes sense. I, even I don't use GPU rendering, so it's just like, I just stick the CPU stuff because it's it's optimized well enough. Like you said, it's not a gargantuan difference. I mean, people are getting like 20 or 30% faster rendering with GPU if it's, you know, optimized nicely. Right, and that's probably, you know, important if you're doing, you know, real renders and not just dicking around making marble machines. <laughs> Well, where it really walls. shines is when you're doing stuff in Eevee, which is rendered on the on the GPU. Like it's a it's a uh, like it's not OpenGL, but it's actually it might be OpenGL. Anyway, it's it's on the graphics card, and so it's using all these shaders and stuff to do the rendering instead of rendering it with with path tracing and and photons and stuff. And uh, and there you can get real time rendering that looks amazing if you've got a good enough GPU. I see. Yeah, I don't use Eevee. Looks like ass. <laughs> well, again, well, I, I get so delighted by ray tracing. Yeah, I get so delighted by ray tracing and radiosity lighting and and all of that that it just like deliberately I will shine a really bright light onto a bunch of colored objects sitting on a white surface just so that I can see the reflected light hit the white surface and you know create splashes. Bounce of off color. of everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Oh, it just, oh, it just tickles my brain. Okay, yeah, and Evie for really some real fun, that. Uh, make the material have a higher than one reflectance, and then the light gets magnified when it bounces off of other objects. And so I it's like each object. Do that. It's, oh, it's incredible. It's so cool. Well, I'll do that next time I'm, I'm not murdering people in Hitman. <laughs> All right, go ahead and t I I didn't highlight this next one, so I don't know. Have a go at it. It's it's a little long. Do your best. All right, <clears throat> Your Excellency, Podcast for Life, Grognod Commander Al Hadid, Doctor Diecast, VC, DSO, MC. FBI, Lord of all beasts of the earth and fishes of the sea and conquerors of the hosting services in cyberspace and in general and one and one in particular. What is your favorite challenge mode in a game? Either self-imposed or as a mutator. You can toggle on more broadly. What do you look for in a challenge mode and what drives you to seek them out? 93. And there's quite a bit more in another paragraph, but those are all his thoughts. Not ours. Thank you for the question, 93. Thank you for that reading. That was fun. <laughs> um, for me, um, several things. Some games I'm compelled to play with permadeath, like Minecraft. Like, I don't use permadeath mode because I don't want it to actually delete the world. I want to come back and look at it, but when I die in a Minecraft world, it usually it becomes like a museum under glass. You know, it's... No longer mm. a place where I build. I just look, here is what I was able to build before I died. Um, and I, I've mm. done that I've, I've done that in a few different games. Uh, in Prey, I was compelled to use no Typhon powers. Like, that's, that's normal for me, is no Typhon powers. Um, which, that's a weird way to play. Everybody else considers that this, oh, if you get bored, you can try playing without Typhon powers. The game sure is different. And for me, that's what the game is, is like. Um, oh, and, wow. Because that's like yeah. the magic system, right? Right. Yeah. And um, the other one, and maybe I picked that up because in System Shock 2, the magic system, I forget what it was called, was actually kind of terrible. Well, it was a minefield. Oh, there no. was like... There was like 50 powers and like five of them were game-breakingly powerful and the rest were a waste of skill points. <laughs> um, so basically so, like control then. Right, right. So, uh, the and the other thing I like doing is playing Hitman wrong. Uh, like I said earlier, that's good for a giggle just because it, you know, shows off. It shows off the system being stretched to the breaking point. It, you know, the Hitman engine is amazing for the way it handles large crowds, but you don't, re like, you'll see this whole party with people shoulder to shoulder. You know, in other ga video games, it's like a party is six people in a room, and they just, like, put lots of mm -hmm. walls everywhere and, like, five people in every room to make it feel like a big party, but there's, like, 20 people here, even though it's supposed to be a big, but in... In Hitman, no, there are hundreds of people in this mansion, and they are shoulder yeah. to shoulder. But you can't really appreciate just how magnificent the engine is until you go into the room and start firing an assault rifle into the air, and you just watch people run. <laughs> and you just watch these masses of people uh, running and tripping, and you don't see... It doesn't look like Attack of the Clones. It doesn't look like, you know, 50 people all doing the same exact animation um doesn't look like three different character models with 50 different textures it's really well done um it's been good for for ages but boy these new games really show it off and you get the most out of it when you play the game wrong so that's my answer you'd like to challenge yourself in a lot of games it it really does if you if one is interested in game systems as opposed to just playing the game itself then it really does like the approach of of trying to do things weird does show off the texture of the engine cuz if you're doing what they, right. they're expecting then it's going to be able to handle that cuz that's what they tested for but if you're like right. i'm going to play taxi simulator in hitman or you know i'm going to play a murder supervillain in roller coaster tycoon uh, right. you know, like that really <laughs> demonstrates 
how the game works, like what's really going on under there. Oh yeah, that's another thing is uh, most Grand Theft Auto games, I really prefer like do the first couple of missions to unlock all the critical stuff and then just dick around with the character in the open world. You know, if you need money, then drive to do just become a taxi driver. Do an hour of driving people around in a taxi and, uh, you know, spend money, tour the place, see the sights, and ignore all the story missions. That's another thing I do. I don't know if that counts as a mutator. <laughs> it's just like not engaging with the worst part of the game. Ooh, deep cut. So, uh, do you play games wrong as a means of getting more fun out of them? Um, not really. I, I usually, I usually don't uh, have. Paul, enough time I've seen to... your base in Satisfactory. <laughs> oh, oh no! Oh, I've been found out. That's not really a mutator, though. That's that's just min maxing. I like to I like to play the opposite of wrong. I like to play so right it's wrong. Fair enough. Optimal play. I mean, really, your play is, like, you, if we were both building in the same world, you'd run circles around me. I would have a nice, neat base where you could find everything, and it's convenient, and there's always a ramp and a way to get up here and see what you're doing and lighting everywhere, and it's a very comfortable place to be. And mm. meanwhile, you're, like, three stages ahead. <laughs> you know, you completed all, you, you're, like, three technology tiers ahead of me. And I'm just, like still my dicking around getting my metastasized tumor factory, <laughs> right? And I've got this, I've got this, you know. Oh, I got trucks working, and you've got ten trains going to a nuclear power plant. Oh man, getting those signals working was such a nightmare because they were just. I I built trains everywhere. Like I covered the whole map and railways and stuff. My, there are no signals, and like everything's crashing and everything else is. Oh, what a wreck. Literally, wrecks everywhere. Oh. So, before the trains could crash into each other, what, they would just clip through each other? Yeah, yeah, they'd just, just drive right, like they didn't exist. Huh, I never discovered that. Interesting. All right. Dear Diecast, with Bioware, Blizzard, and Obsidian releasing very underwhelming fare lately, I was wondering if there were any new developers you guys are keeping an eye on. For, for example, I'm keeping an eye on Concerned Ape who is working on Haunted Chocolatier now that he is mostly done with Stardew Valley. Interesting. My wife was really into Stardew Valley. Veil Tim. Uh, for me, the big two, and I'll bet you this is the same answer Paul has, but for me, Zactronics and Thecla, which is the Zactronics games, which are just like so... Like nobody else makes games like that, and Thecla is John Blow's company. So yeah, Brave same. Witness, that kind of thing, yeah. I'm mostly just going through Steam's suggested library editions or whatever, which are not bad. I mean, for as far as like super villain giant megacorps go, I'd take Steam. That'd be fine. Right. I think the problem we have these days is oh oh, oh um arcane, arcane, prey and death loop. Uh, I'm pretty into them, even though I'm not crazy about Deathloop. I don't think it's a bad game. I just think it's not really my thing, but I still admire what Deathloop did. So I would throw Arc Arcane on that list as like the one AAA company I kind of care about. Mm. Um, the, the problem we have these days is that, you know, you, like the interesting stuff is happening on the indie scene and in the indie scene, it's mostly not great. To, you know, it's not like you have like the Blizzard of old, where you would have this one company with, you know, 12 amazing Game of the Year games. Now you have 12 developers, each of them with an amazing game. One amazing game that they've got. And, right. uh, so it's a good they, problem they to don't have, because now you've got 12 all in one year instead of, like, over a period of a decade. Right, right. But it's like none of these folks seem to hang around long enough to, like... Other than John Blow, uh, most indies kind of bounce from team to team or project to project, and they don't, like, have a brand, and you can't, like, feel this person's specific style. 
Um, I shouldn't say that, but I mean, I haven't noticed anything like that. I'm, I'm sure mm. there's, I'm sure there's stuff like that going on in, um, in genres that I, that I'm not privy to, but in my genres, yeah, there isn't anybody that's like putting on a series of hits. Yeah. Well, and, and also because you don't have to just release a finished game, you can have basically an indefinitely developing work in progress game. Um, people aren't releasing serial hits. They're not doing Starcraft and Starcraft two. And, you know, they're doing this one game like Stardew Valley, for example, where it's like, it just keeps getting better. And like, he's been working on it for like four years now or more, maybe more and working yeah. on it before too. So, so like, not only do we not have these like star development houses, it's more individual people. Like for example, Zach Barth and, and, and John Blow are both, basically one man shops that hire out right some of the work um they're they're the key developers but the stuff that they work on tends to be because they're smaller teams and because you can do this nowadays tends to be longer development cycles and so you've got genre dominating titles that just stick around well like minecraft right like no one's made a minecraft right. killer because minecraft is still a thing <laughs> right and and notch isn't sitting there pumping out other Minecraft like games or like other games of similar stature. He, he retired to Twitter as far as I know. Yeah. Well, and I mean, like if we want to go there, Zach Barth was the one who made Infiniminer, which was what inspired Minecraft. So like, there you go. Oh, wow. And Zach is still making stuff. So, yeah. yeah, that's another thing. I suppose if an indie is really successful, they might be so successful that they don't need to make games anymore. Yeah, that's a kind of weird thing. If you're Notch, like, do you want to make another game? Because if you just make a regular game, everybody will be like, oh, he's lost it. You know, because you made the biggest game ever. It's, it's almost like, the, you know, the filmmaker that has their their debut film knock it out of the park it's like well if i put out a normal film everybody's gonna say i'm washed up or i'm a one-hit wonder or, you know if i retire now people will think i'm a god <laughs> but if i put out a bunch of stuff then the and it's all just normal middle of the road they'll stuff realize i'm immortal yeah right they'll realize that i really kind of got lucky I shouldn't say all lucky. I mean, mm -hmm. I worked hard, but it was, I just happened to be at the right place, right time, right idea. Yeah. 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 It's tough. Well, and, and this happens in music all the time, right? Like the, the second album is always garbage. I mean, it's just like, cause who knows why, but you try something out and you're, you're finding out the development space, the idea space you're exploring. And like, that means right. you're going to fail. You're going to fall off the edge. <laughs> If, do we do just the same thing again and everybody will say we only have that one idea? Or do we go off and do something radically different and then people that like the first thing will be like, oh, this isn't anything like the the first thing. I don't like this mm -hmm. new thing. Yeah. It's like, eh, just, just be a one-hit wonder. Just go out. Just like, oh, yeah, I could keep making games if I've wanted to, but I, I'm just really want to work on my other hobby which is eating pizza <laughs> yeah yeah notch's house literally has a candy room that's just like a wall of different kinds of candy i did not know that it came with a house he didn't build it that way well okay like some people have something fantastical like that like dead mouse has like a recording studio in his house but that makes sense he's mm -hmm. friggin dead mouse he's a music maker guy um but like notch he has a candy room like he's not willy wonka what are you doing with a candy room dude <laughs> yeah. well he may have had it removed i don't know i was just i was looking at the photos of the house w right before he bought it um and there was should a, have had it know, filled with cobblestone <laughs> <laughs> all right back up the truck here we go put my hard hat on <laughs> Just fill up the the entire cubic volume of the room to the ceiling with nothing but cobblestone. <laughs> All right, let's end on this next one. Dear Diecast, about a month ago, a reboot of Babylon 5 was announced. The original well, ran alongside... 
<laughs> the original ran alongside Star Trek DS9. I was a fan of the series in my last years of high school into university, and I even bought the DVD sets. Did you watch Babylon 5? And what would you watch the reboot? Also, when a property is a fandom, is it possible to reboot the property with, while respecting the fandom? Thanks, Will. Thank you for the question, Will. That's, yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. Babylon 5 itself is a fascinating property. Um, I did not see all of Babylon 5 beginning to end. I was that's I was really busy at that time in my life, um, starting my family and and um, you know, and my career, and that that was just mm -hmm. chaos. And moving, I moved a couple times in the space of I think I moved three times in four years. Oh. It's just is just chaos. It was just chaos, and I didn't have time to like. I need to be here on Wednesday at, at 8 o'clock if I want to see my TV show or whenever it was. So I only saw Babylon 5 in pieces and I always enjoyed it. I always thought, man, this show's really good. But, you know, I, I didn't even have the brain space for it to keep track of it. So it kind of came and went. Um, I think the show is fascinating. When I see it now... Um, at the time, I remember thinking how cool the outer space looked, and now it is super dated. Like to a certain extent, like the stuff with models, like um, the original episodes of of Star Trek, the original series, mm. mm -hmm. or Star Wars. That stuff has a kind of timeless quality to it. It still looks good decades later. Okay, the ships don't move much; they kind of slide across the screen. But they look fantastic, even a half century later. But yeah, real physical point, objects that they were really taken moving images of. Right, but that early CGI stuff did not age well at all. And so Babylon Five, you just become every time they they cut to an exterior shot, you just become acutely aware. Uh, it feels like a PlayStation Two cutscene. It really does. Just the the. It's just so primitive. It's you know, this was top of the line in the nineties, and now and now a pro could bash something to you know ten times together better in half the time. Mm, yeah. So I don't begrudge them wanting to reboot it, and maybe I'll be able to watch it this time. <laughs> and and the other thing that really made me sad is that um. How did there was something it was, somebody will correct me in the comments, but the original run they had a clear story arc and it was like, okay, this will take five seasons. And then the TV executive said, no, we want six. And then, like, oh, halfway no. through the fifth season, they were like, actually, you're only getting five. And so, if they just hadn't fucked with it, it would have been this beautiful, complete arc. But they forced them to stretch it out and then rush through the ending. I, I probably messed that story up. It's been 20 years since I heard it. But I remember fans at the time. This was, this was the great crime. Before the horrible ending of Game of Thrones. And before Firefly got cancelled. This was the, the thing that really got fans outraged. Is how Babylon 5 was mismanaged at an executive level. And if you reboot it, you won't have that problem. Or you can make the problem worse, depending on what kind of a person you are. Oh, that's true. That's true. Um, yeah, not everything that gets rebooted is good. Well, and especially with like straight to streaming, like the production pipeline is so much shorter nowadays. Like you can't say like, oh, well, we've got the season locked in because like who like there's no time slots locked in you just are releasing stuff on the internet like you have every excuse to mess around with whatever you want right it would be lovely to get the original story they wanted to tell and to just watch it and to have it you know with modern effects i'd watch that on the other hand boy i'd really miss that original cast those were some amazing people um, I don't suppose we can like digitally recreate them with, I don't know, AI or something. <laughs> right. 
give us a, a middle-aged Bruce Boxleitner who is now quite old. But yeah, it's the, the show the, basically... Was that the thing with Babylon 5 with the, the Cylons or is that something else? That's... No, that was... Um, Battlestar Galactica. Okay. It starts I, with the they're both I, I've yeah, never they seen both, either one, but... Yeah, they're both space properties that start with the B. That's a totally understandable uh, mistake. With, you know, middling CG. <laughs> right. I did not like that. Things had calmed down, and I was able to watch part of Battlestar Galactica reboot, and I checked out real early. It's mm -hmm. like everything wrong with TV at that period in time. Um, oh, no. Heroes and Lost both had the effect where you can feel that the writer is just making this shit up as they go and sort of groping around and then they hit on something the fans like so they'll just keep hitting that note over and over. They're like trying to uh. find the show during production. That's what... No, maybe that's not. Maybe, maybe they had something planned from the beginning and it just felt... Like they didn't know what they were doing or where, or where <laughs> any of these plots were going. They just nailed that improvisational tone. Right? <laughs> that half-assed seat of your pants. We don't have a plan. Let's just, let's just, let's just start writing the beginning of an episode. Well, let's just start filming now and I'll send you pages as we go. Yeah, yeah. Just throw some mysteries into the meat grinder and it'll all come out as sausage in the end. Right, the mysteries. Oh, and the reveals that make no damn sense. And then and then <laughs> later like they, they have a hat to... With like mysteries and a hat with the reveals and they just like pull one out every time they need an episode. Right. Oh, it's so bad. It's so bad. Heroes was terrible with that. Oh, Heroes made me angry, but I watched the whole thing because I'm an idiot. <laughs> I watched like Got two your number. seasons. I watched like two seasons of Heroes, and that show was atrocious. I mean, that show was really extraordinarily bad, shockingly bad. And I knew it was but bad, really fun but I, to watch. No, I kept thinking this is going to get good any minute now. He said wrongingly, <laughs> like the biggest idiot on the planet for twelve episodes in a row, <laughs> right? Oh, no, they would never make... There's no way that the 12th episode in a row will suck. This is the... Okay, there's no way that they'll make 13 lousy episodes in a row. There's no way... Okay, 14. <laughs> 14 is the magic number. <laughs> I'm just going to keep pouring the hours of my finite life into this horrible show and hope that it somehow pays off. Well, that's the price for getting immunized against storytelling bullshit you know that probably that was probably a big part of when i started really thinking about stories is like figuring out what was wrong with heroes and why i was angry but still watching and like learning to spot the tricks that it was using to make me think that something good was about to happen because i didn't have the sophistic i was used to serialized television or episodic television where it's like every episode stands on its own like you know star trek the next generation or the a team or whatever you, mm. there's no overarching continuity and so i was like getting the feel for this ongoing continuity thing and uh well and yeah, you'd also a watched a lot of anime where it does have ongoing continuity but it's actually like thought out beforehand and it's got real right. twists and real payoffs and like they're gonna give you something at the beginning and they're gonna wink and then like right at the end of the end of the last episode they're gonna be like and that's why and you're gonna feel great and it's like oh cool yeah yeah oh i didn't even see that coming oh that's so perfect the way that he did the thing and and he and he got the superpower right at the end. Who would have expected that the when the fate of the universe was at stake, he'd be able to do that thing he'd never been able to do before? What are the odds, man? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm making fun, but like that is that's that's satisfying. That's an arc. <laughs> you have completed your hero's yeah. journey. Here, here is your 
here's your commemorative baseball cap and t-shirt that said I completed the hero's journey and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. Here's the treasure that you can return to the overworld and bring back to your people. So yeah, I don't know what's going to go on with the Babylon 5 reboot. I have room in my heart to give it another try because I basically missed the original. But I'm very curious what the fan, like the diehard Babylon 5 fans think of this. I know nothing about it outside of this email. So like, is the original showrunner involved? Are any of the original cast going to come back for cameos? Are they telling the same story all over again or are they remixing it? Is it... If they're starting over with a new writer, then I have no faith in it. Like the, the original writer, I forget his name, but was kind of unique in television. Um, and if they just hand this off to like the dipshits that, you know, made Teen Titans, then no, this is going to be awful. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not certain that it's possible to quote, respect the fandom, unquote, when you're doing a reboot, just because there are so many different things that the people in the fandom care about that it basically defines the entirety of the property like right you can't reboot something and change anything and make everyone happy so like who in the fandom are you respecting and how much are you respecting them and i just like i don't i don't know where to draw any of those lines certainly you can lean more toward the source material or the original work and certainly you can lean away from it and then you can do what star wars did and like actively spit in the face of the fandom so like you don't have to do that <laughs> right um if you were rebooting star trek the next generation and it's like well what what are you gonna do for the cast are you gonna find another bald englishman to play captain picard or are you just gonna go completely just like Michael Fassbender, a big, handsome British guy. Or you're going to put some, you're just going to make a whole new character that's called Captain Picard, but he's like from Montana and he sits on the bridge with a cowboy hat. <laughs> well, and not only like some bald British guy, but like some bald British guy with decades of acting experience and professional theater acting and yeah. profound respect for everyone in the real life cast and like a true craftsman like can you find another one of those guys because there's not many around right. right there are not many of those guys um that's hard to find um yeah somebody or you could probably the safe thing to do would be to look through the collection of current shakespearean actors and pick somebody from that space just right. so that you is <laughs> a shakespearean actor for crying out loud right. Right, like, okay, well, we'll go for a Shakespearean actor. That would make sense. Okay, that'll probably give him a British accent, more than likely. Um, and does he need to be bald? I don't know. Does he need to, can he be younger? Does, can he be ripped? Can we show him without his shirt off in the trailers and get some ladies to watch? Um, oh, this is... Chris Hemsworth. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Chris Hemsworth, get him Picard, on the phone. Though. Yeah. He's, and like he the just, he's like the anti-Captain Picard. It's like everything Captain Picard flipped upside down. Right, and he would just do his funny Thor personality where he's just like a mumbling goof that's like always wrong about everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> Captain's log or whatever. <laughs> right. Captain's log. Yeah, Captain, there is no no one's taking this log. We're we're in the middle of a desert. Who are you narrating to? The opening um, shot is just different visual puns on the captain's log. Right. And like he just never wears a shirt for no reason. He just <laughs> pins the uniform. He just, like he just like tapes the com badge to his left peck. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, so I I don't know. I don't know if it's possible to, to really respect the fandom or not. You'd have to pick a segment of the fandom and you'd have to, like, decide what... You'd have to decide what it is you're going to do and you have to make it really clear to everybody what it is that you're trying to do. Because otherwise, everyone is going to have a different idea of what it is you're trying to do and right. everyone's going to be disappointed. Right. Oh, it's not the same show. If Oh, they, they gender-flipped data. I, it's not the same show. Who is this character anymore? 
<laughs> right? Even though it's an android, like, it doesn't matter, right. people. <laughs> right, it's uh. like, now we have a woman that doesn't understand idioms. We're in a completely different space. <laughs> but, like, you know, know, as an example of maybe trying to respect the fandom, but not making it clear what you were actually doing, the Final Fantasy VII reboot, where, like, you say, okay, we're going to reboot this property, and it's going to be just like the original. And it's like, well, you've already failed. Like, it's not going to be just like right. the original because you're rebooting it. So, like, what are you rebooting it? And why are you rebooting it? And what is it you're trying to do? And who is this for? And, like, and tell people. But the reason they don't tell people is because they want to play on that ambiguity because you're going to buy it hoping that you're the person they made it for. When right. really, they didn't make it for anyone. They made it for the marketing team. Which is they why they didn't tell themselves. you what, is, what they're doing. Yeah. They made it for the money. Which is a good yeah. way to stay in business. It's true. It's true. Although making stuff that sucks a lot is a great way to go out of business. So I don't know. Um, yeah, it's it's a tough problem. So I'm very curious what Babylon 5, the hardcore fans, think about the idea of a reboot. Is this sacrilege? Are you hoping oh, maybe they'll get it right this time? Um, what are the odds that it's going to be? What are the odds that you think it's going to be an atrocity? It's just going to be like, they're either going to try and make it sexy and they're going to, you know, cast all young hotties and it'll look like, you know, Twilight. Um, it's just, it's just Instagram influencers, the whole cast. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Logan Paul will, will be the, the, the captain. Okay. Well, so let's go at this from a diff different angle. If they were going to reboot Mass Effect, the original trilogy. Like, what would it mean for them to respect the fandom? Oh, yeah. What would that even because, mean? Because yeah. there are people who loved the trilogy as a shooter series, and they're like, oh, it had a weak start, but it was great. And there are people who love the idea of it as, like, this mystery science exploration game. Where it's like, well, you know, the first game started off real strong, and it kind of lost its way at the end. And so, like, there, that's just one bifurcation. And, like, how do you respect the fandom when when there are completely opposite views of what made the series what it is. Yeah, the um the second game is the most popular. People love that game. And then there's like this hardcore we're not a majority, but there's a lot of us that think Cerberus is a ridiculous clown college that does not even belong in this world, much less at the start at the center of the story. How dare you? This is ridiculous and I can't believe in it. And it's like the other fans are like, no, Cibre Cerberus is is the key to all of this. Because he's a funnier character than we've ever had before. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so dense. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. What would it mean? For me, it would mean throwing away the second two games. But that's a terrible business decision. Like, if you throw away the second two games, you're an idiot. That is a bunch of risk for no good reason for a very small uh, segment of the fandom. So, yeah. I guess you could make, like, reboot it twice. Make two completely different games. Just make new stuff. Stop rebooting things. Just make new stuff. There you go. The fans were fans of it because it was something new. Respect the fans by making something new. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was a show. We ran a little long... But that was a great topic, and that was a lot of fun to talk about. Uh, we, we actually have a little bit left in the mailbag. We'll save that for next week. If you have a question for the show, our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Uh, you got to log in to get me to say goodbye. Yeah, I need your phone number, Seamus. <laughs> <laughs>